Good morning, everybody, and welcome to another Florida Friendly Landscaping Educational Program. Um, today, we're going to talk about caring for your landscape when it's hot and dry. And of course, I chose this, you know, in May. May and uh, mid-September, October are good times to go over these um, lessons, you know, things we need to remember about when it's hot and dry. So I thought it was a good time to do it. I am Lily Browning. I do work for Hernando County Utilities in Water Conservation, and I am the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program Coordinator. Um, if you have any questions for me or would like a copy of this program, uh, of this uh, PowerPoint, I can send you a PDF copy. All you need to do is email me, Lily B, L-I-L-L-Y, two L's in the middle, B, as in boy, at hernandocounty.us. And you may um, actually want a copy this time because there's gonna be some links here that particularly if you live in uh, Hernando County, I think will be very interesting and of use to you. These are the nine principles of Florida friendly landscaping. And when we are discussing landscape care, when it's hot and dry, um, certainly many of these principles come into play such as right plant, right place, watering efficiently, fertilizing appropriately, mulch, manage yard pests responsibly, recycling, all these, a whole bunch of them fit right into what we're talking about today. So let's just, um, we're talking about water. I'm with water conservation and I try to cover one or more of those nine principles in everything I teach. But um, if you've noticed in May, and you look at some of the classes that I have done or that I have coming up, it's all about that water conservation. And there's a very specific reason for that. And that's because here at Hernando County Utilities, I mean, you can take a guess as to what month we distribute the most amount of water. Uh, people, um, you know, use up and we distribute the most amount of water, of course, in the month of May, because people have summer on their minds because it is plenty hot enough to be summer, but the summer rains have not started yet. And so our plants are growing and um, then they start looking heat stressed in our heat. So people, you know, use more water than normal. So May is a good time for me to remind you, although these principles will not do any good in May if we have not been practicing them all year long. So we need to keep that in mind as well. One thing we need, um, we're going to talk a little bit about water. And obviously, I think we all know um, that, you know, we've been in science class then in elementary school, and we know the water we have today is the same water that has always existed. Um, we've always had the exact same amount of water. Water doesn't get regen, well, it doesn't get birthed per se, it just gets recycled through the water cycle. The same amount has always existed. Um, and I use this slide when I'm teaching kids because I like to, you know, tell them that it's entirely possible that they are drinking dinosaur pee. Let, you know, you let that go through your mind a little bit. <laughs> um, but we've always had the same water. So you may wonder, well, what's the problem? Well, we also know that water in usable uh, form for humans is not always, you know, readily available. That um, that source is not always just, you know, right there. So there are many factors to that. So we have the same amount of water. Some of it is, you know, going through the cycle. It's in the in the form of evaporation or transpiration from the plants or it is, you know, stuck in ice, or it is, you know, in salt water. So usable water for us is not always as plentiful as we would like, and, but the same amount of water is around, but we have way more people 
than we ever have had on you know the earth before and this year is just looking at florida i have been in florida since 1978 i um and anyone who's been here any length of time knows there is no possible way to you know there's no such thing as a semi-native to the natives <laughs> you're either native or you're not and um i am not native i made some natives but that still doesn't get me any extra credit um but i've been here a very long time and in here in hernando county i have lived in hernando county all those 40 all these 43 years so i've seen a whole lot of changes um i just saw a facebook um post that i shared which said basically it said nobody with nothing after it, meaning no one's saying anything. And then it said long time or native Floridian. All this used to be orange groves. <laughs> we give up that information all the time and I can ride around Hernando County and tell you, wow, all the changes that have occurred. But our population right now you see is 20 million. And it's the third highest in the state. It's growing all the time. COVID really, um inspired a shift where people realize you know that they don't have to be located geographically where they work um so there's been a big shift in that and they're like well heck i'm going to move down to florida where i won't have winter or where i can afford a house that might be changing too <laughs> very, very soon or i can be near my parents or whatever it is we're getting a lot of people here and by 2040 which I'll just be retired by then. No, no, I'll be way retired by then. That's right. Um, but we will have 26 million projected. A lot of people to share the same water source with. So here in Hernando County, we are on one day a week watering. So here is the schedule. If your address ends in zero or one, your day to water is Monday and so on down the line. If you look here, you will see there are no weekend um, watering days. A little hint there, if you see people watering on the weekends, um, there there's, shouldn't be anybody watering on the weekends. Um, also, up here, here are the hours that you're allowed to water before 8 a.m. or after 6 p.m. And I always like to highlight that little itsy bitsy word because it's extremely important. That is or, that is not an and. That doesn't mean you get to water twice in that same 24 hour period. Um, that is definitely an or there. So you have to choose one or the other. This is the biggest misconception here in Hernando County, and I hear it probably daily. People believe, maybe because they want to believe or whatever it is, that if they are on a private well, that they are not subject to Hernando County watering restrictions, and that is an untruth. In fact, everyone is um, subject to these once per week watering restrictions. I you know, live outside of the area that the company I work for serves. So I have a private well for all of the water at my house. These watering restrictions apply to me. Um, there are several people uh, who may live within our system who pay us for the water that comes you know, into their home, but they have a private irrigation well for irrigation only. And some of those people who happen to live near a waterway, a surface waterway, actually pull the water from that for that irrigation well um, from that body of surface water. They are also bound by the one day per week watering restrictions. So really the only question that you have to ask yourself if you're wondering, do these watering restrictions apply to me? One question you got, do I live in Hernando County? 
<laughs> that is really it. And you can spread that amongst your your cousins and your neighbors and your brother down the road. And, you know, we're all under these same systems, uh, under the same watering restrictions here in Hernando County. And here's where some of the rules come from, um, a couple of places, but this is from the Southwest Water Management District. We rely on them um, to set the watering rules, yet we have the um, capability of making them more strict. And we have. <laughs> so I, what I highlighted here under the year-round water conservation measures um, from Swift Mud is, well, the year-round water conservation measures contained in this section are applicable to all users, including end users, that's us, served by public or private water systems, even your own private water system. And it also, you know, if you're wondering why we can have more strict rules than the Water Management District, um, any restrictions or other measures declared pursuant to this chapter or any board or executive director order that is more restrictive than a water conservation measure contained in this chapter shall supersede the water conservation measure for the duration of the applicable order. What that means is if a municipality has a more strict rule than a district, municipalities rule is you know what you follow the more strict one there's also another place if you really want to get into the nitty-gritty of our watering restrictions look up the muni code um, for hernando county i provided this link here i just went to hernando county code enforcement and then you know in the, up in on the left was mentioning the muni code the municipal code and um, then I found, you know, water conservation and this article X1, I guess it's 11 year round watering restrictions. And it will really spell it out in detail for you. So you can either get a PDF of this or just email me and say, hey, can I have that link? And I'll make it easier, you know, for you to find it. You don't have to search as much as I did. So why? Why, 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 if I have my own well, am I subject to the watering restrictions? And I hear this all the time, and I'm part of a Facebook group for my neighborhood. And as I said, I'm out of the um, municipal system. And wow, I mean, one person made a comment that she was concerned with a house being built next to her that basically had the sprinkler systems on all the time. And you know how those Facebook groups are, they just basically ate that poor woman alive, basically saying that, you know, um, you know, don't live up here in the wild, wild west. If, you know, you wanna pick on people about what they do, we can all do whatever we want. Not quite true. And one day, you know, code enforcement may take a ride up there and they will find out otherwise. You cannot do just whatever you want. But, and the reason for that, all of us, every one of us are pulling our water from our aquifer. We're all getting it from the same source, whether it is Hernando County Utilities or the city of Brooksville who have big pipes, you know, to serve a lot of people, or those of us with private wells with a little pipe to serve just us, we're all sticking our straws in the same glass. So, not only do the watering restrictions help conserve that water for us, it also helps with the pressure put on the aquifer because what if everyone decided 5.30 on Monday was the time they wanted to water? That would be you know, a lot of pressure on the aquifer itself. Maybe not translating to literal pressure problems for you, but just, you know, that's, that's asking a lot of the aquifer. So we kind of stretch it out and as you see here, this is where all of most of Florida gets their water and certainly all of Hernando County from um, the aquifer, which is a series of, it's like a sponge, you know, the lime rock under the water is like a sponge where it has holes where the water resides. 
and you can see it, it is um, it's called the Floridan aquifer if you're interested not the Floridian that's not a um, typo it is literally the Floridan aquifer and as you can see it stretches beyond Florida and that is our savings account for water if you think about it that way it is the absolute best storage place to keep water nature knows what it's doing and we need to do our best to protect it to protect it from you know the threats that may exist um you know sure down the line you know we can convert salt water uh to drinking water extraordinarily expensive venture to do that um and you know not always it's just so much better the way that nature has made it it's put it in this nice protected area called the aquifer um and you know like i said it's our savings account it's and it's the safest place for the water and the threats to it are that population growth that i referred to with that population growth comes more and more impermeable surfaces as i mentioned we long time Floridians, this all used to be orange groves. Well, those were permeable surfaces. Before they were orange groves, they were woods or you know swamps or you know whatever nature intended them to be. Certainly permeable surfaces. Why do we need permeable surfaces? Obviously for aquifer recharge areas where we can make deposits into that water bank um, that we need. Climate change is making a difference. Sea level rise, and which could lead to saltwater intrusion. Pollution, that comes with the people. And sinkhole formation, that's a, you know, a natural thing here in Florida, but the pressure and the things that we're doing to our environment, you know, sometimes cause these sinkholes to happen where they wouldn't have occurred otherwise. And the reason I talk so much about water um, conservation in the month of May, as I said, that is our biggest month that we distribute the most water. Also, all year long, and this is not just us, this is pretty much an average for all municipal um, you know, water systems. 60% of the water that we distribute is put right on lawns. 60% of it. So that is something I am hoping, you know, in my job to make a change to. I know there are people out there who are fans of Florida friendly landscaping, but they they um, don't like lawns. They don't understand why it seems like I'm promoting lawns. I'm not promoting lawns. It's, you know, <laughs> your yard, your choice. But what I'm trying to do is I don't think when I teach you how to irrigate efficiently that I am encouraging those who do not irrigate to start irrigating. <laughs> I know you guys, I, I'm a non-irrigator as well. I'm not going to start irrigating. You're doing good over there. I need to focus my attention, especially in May, to those who are probably inadvertently, you know, without enough knowledge, using too much water. And that's who we need to teach how to be more efficient at it. So here is um, a good comparison. And this is one thing I came up with this morning, which is why I was glad this class or I finally got to be 10 o'clock because I wouldn't leave this PowerPoint alone. And so it might end up being, might have ended up being two hours long. Um, here, I, these are actual bills from um, our system cut off so you can't see you know information but i just happened to know uh two of these people that i looked up and i know the one on the left um has two people in their home and they don't use irrigation they don't put on their lawn irrigation turns out they do have a vegetable garden so like in the month of may they'll be using a little more because nature isn't helping them with their vegetable garden. But so this is kind of hard to read. So I'll show it to you um, down at the bottom in September of 21. 
the way this reads, it means they actually used 6,900 gallons. So as you can see, they average in the six, sixes, um, thousand gallons for two people. Here, like I said, um, they have had to water uh, their vegetable garden. So, you know, it went up a little bit and they've had to add a little to their pool. So it's gone up to 9,100. It's gonna go back down again as soon as the summer rains start to be back in this 6,000 gallons category. Now, this is someone I know that I am fairly certain. Now, these people do not live in a deed restricted community on the left, people on the right do. And I'm fairly certain that this person follows Hernando County's watering restrictions. So they only water on their day to water. Look at the difference from someone who is, you know, following the rules. They're not doing anything they're not allowed to do. Um, so this, as I said, this person used more on their vegetable garden. Um, so they ended up using 9,000 gallons as compared to their normal seven, six, somewhere in there. This person in the same month used 19,100. In April, they used 19,800. March, they used 22,700. February, 17,200. That's from watering one day a week. Do you see the big difference in water use? So imagine, and you know, we are not naive enough to not know there are people not obeying the once a week watering rules. If you're getting higher than this, you know, it, yeah, we can, we can, you know, pretty much tell. Now we're not allowed to report them. We don't do anything like that, but, I'm just showing you the difference between that 60% of water that goes on your lawn compared to those who choose another route of not using that supplemental irrigation. Makes a big difference in your water bill too. I didn't show you what their bill costs because you know that's kind of sensitive information, but also the difference is these people have a septic tank. These people are on the sewer. So that makes a difference in the price as well. So when we are concentrating on the lawns and what we need to do with these lawns and how much they need watered, first we need to um, or realize what type of lawn do I have. So we're going to talk about the two main common lawns here. And the first one would be a Floritan lawn or a St. Augustine lawn. If you leave, if live in a deed restricted community, chances are really high that you have this Floritan lawn. Floritan is a variety of St. Augustine. So you may hear those terms interchangeable, but there's about 20 some varieties of St. Augustine. Floritam is the specific one that is pretty common around here. So the question I'm gonna get, okay, you showed me how much, you know, my watering one day a week, you know, costs me. And, and as far as how much, how many gallons of water, so you want an easy answer. You want me to tell you how long to put on each zone. And I really wish I could, but life doesn't work that way. <laughs> There's too many uh, variables to figure that out. I don't know your water pressure. I don't know what type of irrigation heads you have in each zone, you know, the size of your yard, uh, various things. But I can still help. So we can't say, Put on 20 minutes per zone, everyone, and you'll all be set. We just don't know that. But we can help you um, let you know how much, not how long you should put on your water, but how much water to put on. And that St. Augustine, that floor tam lawn, will do fine on half an inch to three quarters of an inch per watering event. And you may say, what? I don't understand what that means. I don't know how to translate that in my head. Well, it's really easy. And I bought some visual aids just like are on the picture here. I had these yesterday in a little chat that Dr. Lester and I had together, but since then I have removed the tuna out of them. 
might have some nice tuna salad in my refrigerator <laughs> right now. But so I took the tuna out of these and inside I used a ruler. I put it in here to measure half an inch. And I, with the ruler there, use the Sharpie to measure half an inch. I'll show you that I just did it because, of course, I got Sharpie on me. That's just bound to happen. <laughs> so anyway, I've marked half an inch. You see that in there? Oops, there we go. I've marked half an inch. I'm going to get a bunch of these. I have actually four at the moment, these two, these two, but I'm going to need to get more. And um, I'm going to put them out randomly in my zone. And I'm going to turn on, turn on that zone for 10 minutes. That is what that muni code that I had referred to, that's how long it says I can turn it on to test. You have to stand out there with it while you're testing it. And so I'm going to turn it on for 10 minutes and see how full this can got. If I only got a third of the way to my black mark there, to that half inch, what's that going to tell me? I had it on for 10 minutes. It only got a third of the way. That's right. I'm going to set that zone for 30 minutes. I don't do math, but I can do that kind of math. If it, you know, if it um, got halfway, then I'm going to set that zone for 20 minutes. It's not all that exact. It's not rocket science, but I bet you it'll make a big difference in how much you're watering and how much you're paying for the water and how much water you're wasting. So that is one very simple way to figure out each and set each zone by how far it gets to that half inch line. You may feel like half inch is not enough. It's, it's not a satisfying amount of water, <laughs> um, but we have to get over our emotions and stay with the science because it says here, a simple watering schedule would apply half an inch to three quarters of an inch when the turf grass begins to show the drought stress symptoms. I'll show you what, that are, what those are. Once this amount of water is applied, do not apply again until drought is noticeable. If it rains, suspend irrigation until visible drought symptoms appear again. That I took right out of a publication called Watering Your Florida Lawn from the University of Florida from Dr. Lori Trenholm, Dr. Brian Unruh, and Dr. Cesar. They are all experts in um, turf. That half an inch in sandy soil, well, see, I can't see it now, I've got stuff in front of it, but it'll hold um, water in the top 12 inches of that soil. This also is again from watering your Florida lawn by all these smart doctors here. If the roots are in the top 12 inches of soil, which that certainly you know would be, um, and the soil is dry, then water at half an inch is required to wet the area thoroughly. Just that half inch in our sandy soil is gonna reach down that far. Like frequent watering, which people try to bargain with us and say, okay, what if I water the amount you want me to, but in, in two times, <clears throat> using half the amount each time? No, light frequent water is inefficient and encourages shallow root system. There's two problems with that request. You know, it does, it, it, it gets your lawn used to getting watered too frequently and it's not going to send its roots out to get a job and find the water. It's gonna rely on the water handouts from you. The other thing is, may, you know, perhaps you are very, very trustworthy to, you know, say, I want to do it twice a week, but only use, but still use the same amount of water. Perhaps you are a very trustworthy person to do that. We have 180,000 people, you know, to try and control. So there just has to be very, very standard rules for everybody. 
Um, and as we said, it's not good for your lawn. That light, frequent watering is inefficient. People will stand by it because for a period of time, their lawn looks good doing that. When in reality, they have a hydroponic lawn that is so reliant on you giving it the handouts of that water that basically you have, um, you know, a kind of a, a long-lived perennial or a short-lived perennial. You're only going to get a few years out of it that way. It's going to start succumbing to whatever disease is out there, probably take all root rot because of the uh, weak and shallow root system. So it'll look really nice for a little while, <laughs> but not be a strong, healthy lawn. Here, um, the doctors mentioned when the lawn showed drought stress is when you should water again. So what does that mean? Here's two really telltale signs. The leaf blades, every 50% of them or more, start folding in half like this. You see, this is a you know, really good picture of it. Instead of being spread out, it's folding in half. It's trying to conserve water on its own. That is a sign that says, hey, if it doesn't rain before my next watering day, I'll go ahead and water. Also, oh, footprints uh, remain on the lawn. If you walk across it, and those are going to be there for a little while, a few minutes. If, you know, the, the grass doesn't pop back up. You know how the doctor like tells you, you know, to find out if you're dehydrated by pulling up on the skin of your hand and if it doesn't pop back, you are dehydrated. It's kind of the same test with your lawn. If you walk down on it and it doesn't pop back, it's starting to get dehydrated. So again, okay, lawn. If nature doesn't give you any rain before it's my watering day again, I will go ahead and, and water that half inch, you know, for what you need. And here's, um, we're going to talk about irrigation next week. Actually, I'm going to let Dr. Lester pretty much take over that um, particular program. He's going to talk about your, your system, how it works, how to keep it in good order, all the details on that. There's just one thing I want to talk about today. The number one thing you should remember about irrigation is switch around in your brain how you think it works. It is designed to supplement natural rainfall, not the other way around. We move here, we think everyone has irrigation systems, we should get one too, and that is the lifeline and the life support for our lawn. And if it rains, cool. No, that is not how it's meant to be. Rain is the lifeline for your landscape. If you don't happen to be getting enough, that's where your irrigation system should come in as a supplement. I think that'll really change our way of thinking things. And speaking of rain, <coughs> you should, if you have an irrigation system, by law, have a rain sensor. Um, that is the law, but I have seen them, you know, stuck up there and not um, attached <laughs> to the system. I've seen them sideways. I've seen them upside down. I've seen where a tree is growing over them. These systems, what they're designed to do is you set it up here. We're going to set it at half an inch. So there's a cork inside that swells up when it rains and it sends a signal to your system. It has rained. This lawn has gotten half an inch, don't come on. There are some, you know, so many different types. But the University of Florida did a test, Dr. Dukes here did a test, and he had his grad students, you know, put every rain sensor they could find on poles out in a field, and the longest one functioned for three years. I bet your rain sensor is older than that. So check out your rain sensor, pour some water over it for a period of time to let that cork swell up, keep the water pouring over it, have somebody else try and turn on your irrigation, it should not turn on. That's another test you're allowed to do. But here Dr. Dukes is showing a soil moisture system, more expensive of course, but they are coming down in price. 
they come wireless now um, that are about 400 times more efficient than the ones you put on your roof because they're living in the soil and they send a signal. Like I said, you can get wireless now. You can even watch it on your phone. They have smart apps. They have all kinds of things going on. But they send a signal saying, hey, over here, this, this, we're pretty dry over here. So, you know, when it's time, put the system on. You want to put them in your yard where it's not <clears throat> overly dry or in an area that's saturated. You want to put them in your yard. And, you know, there's several of them of the sensors that you put around that is pretty, you know, an average area for your yard. Or the simple solution, you know, for those who don't want to rely that much on rain sensors, when we're getting good rain, go into that garage, put that system on off, and then put it back on when you need it. Don't leave it on manual. Now, we have said earlier that you're allowed to water within the rules um, after 6 p.m. or before 8. As a Florida-friendly landscaping uh, person, I would tell you that early morning time is the best time for your lawn so that the um, moisture is not sitting there all night long, which could tend to cause problems um, with fungus. Also, um, if you're watering too much and you have created a swamp out there and it's very, very wet, then that soil profile, all the critters in there are not going to want to stay down where it's very, very wet there. You're going to encourage them to come to the surface. And then their predators are going to be attracted to your yard. So that's another thing, you know, think about, hmm, do I want all that going on? You want to watch out for leaks. Leaks are extremely expensive. I promise you, if you suspect you have a leak, an irrigation contractor is going to be much more cost efficient than ignoring it and getting a bill from us. This is a bill somebody got in uh, January of 2017. Um, if you look here in December of 16, again, it's kind of hard to read, so I'll show you. They use 9,200 gallons. In January 17, they used 218,000 gallons, 700. We see that amount. We are 90% sure that's a leak. Um, unless you just really went crazy. But look at their bill. It went from $20.29 to $2,606.76. Nobody wants that. Nobody wants anything like that. That's why I put all this money around this <laughs> leak here, because that is really what you're looking at. Um, you can get an adjustment here in Hernando County. You would have to call customer service. You get a once a year adjustment for unpleasant surprises like this. You don't have to call customer service and they'll figure it all out for you. And as I mentioned, you are allowed and it's uh, recommended that you go and check on your irrigation system. Make sure it's doing what it's supposed to be doing. Check for broken, clogged, or misaligned heads. Bill's going to cover all of this really well next week. So I'm not going to dwell on it right now. But as I said, you may operate your sprinkler system for cleaning and maintenance purposes with an attendant on site, meaning you have to be there no more than once a week. <laughs> and a total run time for each zone shall not exceed 10 minutes during the test. That is right out of the, the Muni code. But if you're looking at your lawn and it's not looking good to you, we have a tendency as humans to, what's the first thing you think? I gotta water it more. Well, that may not be the issue. There are other issues with your lawn. It doesn't always need more water. In fact, you may exasperate the issue by adding more water. Um, the, the issues could be your mowing practices, your fertilization practices, maybe it's diseases or insects. So let's talk about, I talk about this all the time, don't I? Because it is so extremely important and it's so simple. It's such a simple fix. If you let that lawn go to four inches, don't cut it any shorter. 
That's really what these rulers are here for. If you go to the Hernando County Extension Office, they can um, give you one of these rulers for free. I'm trying to show you, see where that star is? That's showing you four inches. These are uh, exclusive Lily Browning designed rulers, by the way. So, you know, you might want to get them. They might be collectible one day. <laughs> where this star is, is four inches. So you want to take that, put it in your lawn, make sure that, you know, this is flat on the ground. As you see here with this measuring tape, that lawn is not four inches. It may look a little higher than you're used to, but you we got to get used to it because it is just so imperative to the health of your lawn. You're, you know, you're going to hold on to that moisture longer because you're going to have longer roots. You're going to have healthier roots. The blades will have more surface. They'll be able to photosynthesize it will get thicker and um, have better weed you know, resistance. Just overall, having that higher lawn. You don't live on a golf course. You don't have Bermuda, you know, putting green lawns. These are the lawns that we have, and both Bahia and St. Augustine need to be kept high. On the same, uh, at the same time, it is better for the health of the plant that you only cut off a third of the blade at a time. So you wanna mow often, you wanna keep that blade very sharp, um, but you wanna do your best not to let it grow, you know, eight inches and then cut it in half. You, you want to, you know, not remove more than a third of the blade at, the at, the, at a time, that is the ideal. And also don't throw away those grass um, clippings. Really, really no reason to do that. This does not cause thatch. What causes thatch is overwatering, over fertilizing. Adding, letting the grass clippings go back to your lawn. Grass cycling is what we refer to on the other side of this super duper roller. Here is grass cycle, return your clippings to the lawn or compost your grass. Um, each of those little blades of grass contains enough nitrogen that you can skip one fertilization a year. So one easy way there. And speaking of fertilization, we do have a Hernando County fertilizer ordinance. I'll tell you a little bit about it. Um, before you fertilize, find out why. Don't just do it because it's a certain time of year. Get a soil test. You can get that from the county extension office and find out, you know, what you need to do. Why, why are you fertilizing? I don't, I haven't fertilized my lawn, I don't think ever. Um, not with actual fertilizer. Last year I put down some composted um, cow manure, but not with, you know, a formulated fertilizer or anything. You're going to use one, follow the directions. The label is the law. Also, it is the most scientifically proved way, you know, to be successful. Here in Florida, weed and feed products just do not work. I know they're right there when you walk in the big box store. They are just not compatible with our lawns because those are two different events that should happen at two different timings. And here's the thing a lot of people don't realize. If you don't fertilize or if you fertilize too little, you're not going to kill your lawn. Over fertilizing, fertilizing inappropriately could very well kill your lawn. Just something to think about there. Here's that ordinance I referred to. Um, we have a blackout period when you homeowners are not allowed to fertilize their lawns. You may fertilize your vegetable garden, you may fertilize your fruit trees, things like that, but you may not fertilize your lawn between January 1st and March 31st. Companies are allowed to, if they have a license to apply fertilizer and they're using slow release only. Now, the only reason that we gave them that leeway is because of the amount of time, you know, customers they may have, they may need to 
get started mid-March to be able to get it all done. The University of Florida recommends in their publications, you know, that in Central Florida, you can fertilize March 15th. Will not hurt your lawn at all and if you wait till March 1st and you'll be violating the ordinance here if you don't, if you're a homeowner. So we gave them that little bit of two weeks that they can fertilize, you know, March 15th. If they're fertilizing in January, question them. <laughs> There's no reason to be fertilizing a dormant lawn. Yeah, that's all I'm going to say about that. And um, there are other rules about not fertilizing within 10 feet of a body of water. If you're if we're expecting a big rainfall, not to fertilize. If you spill fertilizer, do not, do not hose it away. Sweep it up, put it back in the lawn or back in the bag. Um, there are some issues coming where it's been being discussed. COVID kind of slowed it down, but it keeps coming up to our commissioners. This group of people who want us to be like these southern counties and, you know, because of stormwater runoff, don't allow fertilizer June, July, and August. You know how government runs, you know, that may be quite a while before that happens. But if it does, I can promise you one thing, January through March will not be taken off. <laughs> so if this changes, it's gonna be getting stricter, you know, not, not just switched around. Insects were one of the things I mentioned, and we have stuck in our minds that if there's a problem with St. Augustine grass, it must be chinch bugs. I tried watering it, I tried fertilizing it, that didn't work, it must be chinch bugs. I can tell you Hernando County Master Gardeners have not seen a chinch bug in four or five years. So that is um, diminishing as a problem for St. Augustine grass. So if you have somebody standing up six feet tall, looking down at the lawn, telling you you have chinch bugs, they must be Superman with their eyes, but have them show you. Also bring a sample into the county extension office, uh, half good, half bad lawn. They will look for insects, but another thing they're gonna look for is, a, is diseases and a really prevalent disease in central Florida for Floritan lawns is this take all root rot. And for free, they will take a piece and put it under the microscope and see if it has the rhizomes for that particular issue. And they'll give you advice on managing it. And here in Hernando County, here's their address. Um, they are right next to the post office on Spring Hill Drive in the airport complex there. Thursdays are the best days to go because Bernie will be there to help you out. So if you have a Bahia grass lawn, that was all about St. Augustine. Bahia, I would say, don't worry. And I have had many, many people tell me and I've experienced too, you know, before that rain starts, we're getting pretty tempted to get out there with some kind of irrigation because it's crunchy. It's literally crunchy as you're walking across it and you think, I finally did it. I finally killed my Bahia lawn. And guess what? Each time the summer rains start, we find out, no, we didn't. That lawn's going to pop back just fine. Look at all the roadsides. That's all Bahia grass. So, you know, nobody is uh, watering them except nature. So it turns out, you know, your Bahia is pretty, pretty tough. Again, keep it mowed high. You can fertilize it if you want to. It doesn't matter if you don't. <laughs> Once or twice a year. I said, I, I, last year I overseeded it and put down some composted cow manure uh, when the rains started. And that's the first time in probably 11 years I did anything to it. And it's still, you know, it really did help. And it looks pretty good even today. Um, if you have issues with, Bahia grass. Here are the issues that are probably potentially causing it. Overwatering. You're watering it too much. It doesn't like to be watered all the time. Too much nitrogen. Too high of a pH. Now that's something you really can't change, not for any you know, discernible length of time. 
So what you would have to change in that situation is the plant. You know, you can't change the environment. Or not enough sun, Bahia has to have six, eight, six to eight hours of sun every day. Again, if it doesn't, then it's time to change what kind of plant you have in that area. This is such a great thing that's been occurring and research has been going on about it. Uh, Dr. Evan Dean in, um, at the University of Florida, he's been running research at in Marion County at On Top of the World. Research with a compost material that they put down before they put down new sod and getting really good results from that. Also, um, if, that, if it's too late for you, you already have your sod, you can use a composted material as a top dressing, like a fertilizer um, once a year or so. It is not counted as a fertilizer, but it really helps improve the water holding and nutrient holding capacity of sandy soil. So that is something really to look into for the future. So you have other areas other than you know your lawn um, when it's hot and dry to worry about. So that you have plants out there that I call the divas, uh, your azaleas, your impatiens, things like that, that in, in the mid afternoon, they are going to tell you that they're dying. They're gonna be overly dramatic about it and try and make a big scene, <laughs> but you're gonna tell them, okay, diva, listen, talk to me in the morning. If they still look wilted in the morning, then go ahead and water those areas. Um, and I'll tell you how you can water them. We are not in a drought, just so you know, we are within the normal range, um, but it's just, it's spring in Florida and it's dry. If we were getting into drought situations, the water management district would make certain moves and I would let you know, you know about those. And at those times, you would also want to consider saving the very, very important plants to you and let the others kind of tough it out. And we're not really at that situation, but that, you know, it might come, I'm going to concentrate on the ones in front of my house or ones of special meaning to me, make sure they get the water, they get the priority. Right now, I think, you know, with our various watering systems, though, you know, you can provide water to all of the plants in your yard. And micro irrigation, I'm gonna get Dr. Lester, I think it's August 3rd, sometime coming up. He's actually gonna do a class for us on micro irrigation as well, drip irrigation, things like that. Here's an example of some, you know, that's a much better idea for your plant beds than the overhead um, irrigation that your lawn gets. Mulch is gonna help you um, conserve water in your soil, but you want to make sure you only have a two to three inch layer or else the mulch is just going to absorb any of the water that comes along and you don't want that. Um, and pull it away from the base of the plants. When, here's something easy you can do if you're concerned about you know, drought and your plants. There's weeds all over the place. <laughs> I have plenty of weeds too. Well, those weeds are in competition for resources, for that water. So that's one way you can help your landscape plants um, get more water is by taking away the competition. Of course, you can recycle water. There's so many different ways to do that. Um, I've talked to several people lately who literally keep a bucket in the shower with them. So that extra water that would normally just go down the drain, they've got a bucket full of water that they can you know, use on their landscape plants. Um, another thing, if you're cooking some vegetables or something in water, let it cool. And then you know that evening after dinner, go out and put that on your landscape plants. It has nutrients <laughs> built in it too. Um, you know, if you are re-landscaping, try to have as many pervious surfaces, surfaces that absorb that water as possible. And your downspouts, utilize them. Don't send them down the street. 
creating stormwater runoff, keep them in your yard, hoard, hoard that water, send it to your lawn, you know, or a plant bed. Make sure that it gets to a vegetated area. Of course, here um, at work, they call me the rain barrel lady. I usually have two rain barrel workshops a month. I don't think I will in June. Um, I'll have one. But if you are interested in obtaining a rain barrel um, and live in Hernando County, they are $64. You will receive a $30 credit on your water bill for your first rain barrel. Um, I have a virtual class coming up next week and another virtual class June 23rd. The pickup days will be the following days for you to pick up your rain barrels. Email me, that's the way you start um, signing up for a rain barrel workshop is by emailing me. Um, at this time, we do not have any compost bins um, available. So um, I can put you on a waiting list so we know when we can have compost bins, which are free to Hernando County residents. Um, or you can install a rain garden. And I have classes coming up on what a rain garden is. Basically, it is a depressed garden that allows you to keep water in your yard and lets it infiltrate into the ground. <clears throat> there are things you want to avoid when it's hot and dry because your plants are already stressed. So pruning stresses them more, fertilizing stresses them more. If you can avoid getting, you know, installing new plant material right now, it is best to wait till nature is helping you. And what people want to do is this time of year, they start thinking, I really need some drought tolerant plants or some natives. So I'm going to put them in and everything's going to be fine. Any new plant, whether it's a drought tolerant plant, whether it's a native plant, any new plant needs more water to get established. So during the dry times, it is not the time to install even the drought tolerant plants. That takes pre-planning. So you do that, put them in during the rainy season so that when you know September or so comes around and we're in a dry season again, then you know, you're all set, but it's not the time to do it in the middle of the dry season. If you have to install new sod, then um, we have a 60 day variance, but you must follow very specific rules to water that in. And email me is the best way to have the, the chart sent to you. See, this says days one through 10, water two to three times a day for five to 10 minutes. That's only for new sod in 50% or more of your yard. So um, not only is this part of the watering restrictions, you know, and what you're allowed to do, it's also the best thing for your lawn. If the sod guy tells you water each zone for an hour each, say, okay, thank you, here's your check, and then email me and ignore what he said, and we will we'll get you straight. What if you want to seed? You um, are not, you don't get the 60 day um, variance from reseeding only if you're down to bare, 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 bare soil to put that seed down, do you qualify for the variance, you know, the 60 day variance. If you're just overseeding, um, you don't get any special watering restrictions, which is why I wait until summer to just throw some extra seed around in my Bahia grass lawn. If you're trying to seed in patches, look on the Muni code, <laughs> what you're allowed to do is water those only after six or before eight, but by a targeted means. You can't put on your overall irrigation system. You can, a targeted means means you with a hose, with a self-canceling nozzle. It can even mean one of those old fashioned um, sprinkler heads, you know, like the little donut things at the end of a hose, only if it's only getting that patch or even a soaker hose. But remember, it can only be on 
uh, before eight or after six, and I only by that targeted means. Here are some of the publications that will help you out about watering your Florida lawn. Again, remember we're in Hernando County and the University of Florida is writing to all of Florida. So keep in mind our watering restrictions, take what they have to say um, about watering, but remember if they mention more than once a week, then that, that's not us that, you know, we have to abide by the once a week. But here's some other improving your drought, your lawn's drought tolerance. And this Florida friendly landscaping web tool is always pretty cool. Um, also links, if you follow my Facebook page, um, you'll be able to keep up with classes and other information and also extensions Facebook page. This is gonna go um, right when I'm done. I send it to our public information office and they put it up on YouTube. So go to Hernando County Government YouTube. This will be the 77th or 78th um, video I have on there. So if you wanna fall down that rabbit hole, find out other information, it's a great place to go and just be patient. Be patient through these dry times because um, the rainy season's coming. It's coming in mid-June. I've been telling people June 11, 3.38 p.m. That's, uh, that's my bet on it. So, so just be patient for June 11, 3.38 p.m. The rainy season will start here in Hernando County. It's going to start over east before that. It has a hard time crossing 75. <laughs> For whatever reason, it starts like a week or so sooner. Then it gets over 75, and then it gets stuck somewhere around Brook Ridge, <laughs> um, on the Brooksville Ridge. And then finally, you know, the rest of us on the coast there, um, we get the rainy season as well. Uh, these are the upcoming classes. Um, as I said, next week, Dr. Lester is going to talk to us in detail about our irrigation system. And then I have that virtual evening Green Bureau workshop. June 1st, we'll be done with May, so I can talk about new fun things again. And uh, we're going to talk to have a virtual pollinator plant starter kit. Uh, and at the end of June, uh, Carmen Bruno, our recycling coordinator, is going to be talking to me with me about recycling inside and out. I have started meeting at the libraries in person um, again. So if you don't wanna watch the pollinator class online, you can watch it in person uh, at 2.30 at the Spring Hill Library. Yes, August, um, oh, July 27th will be rain gardens, like I discussed. August 3rd will be micro irrigation, that's Dr. Lester. And that was specifically requested um, so we're like a radio station. We will play your requests. Might take three months, but we'll do it. And then I'm also doing rain gardens at the library in person. Oh, I have another class I didn't add in here. Um, uh, it's going to be July 20th. Um, and I'm, I believe I'm fitting in there and that's going to be native plant starter kit. And Rita Grant is a native plant expert and she's gonna be leading that one. That one should be really, really good. So again, here is my email, Lily B, L-I-L-L-Y-B um, at hernandocounty.us. Eileen, I'm sorry, I'm not able to um, get to your question right now, but please um, email me and I'll be glad uh, to answer you then. Everybody have a very good day. And um, we will see you next week. And we'll be talking about your irrigation system. Thank you and have a wonderful Florida friendly day.